So Acts chapter 16, and uh, I want you to notice Paul, verse 1. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was, well, aren't they all? But we're, this particular son of a certain woman, the woman is a Jewess, okay? There's nothing deep about him being the son of a certain woman. Usually all the males have that in common. And, 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 but his son of a certain woman who was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported by the brethren that they were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised them because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered. Okay, so you can see in verse number six, uh, now when they had gone throughout Phrygia, the region of Galatia, what is the current nation that we would find those places in? Turkey. Turkey, thank you. So they're traveling through modern day Turkey. Isn't that something to know that at one time, the very first churches, in fact, isn't that amazing to think that in Turkey, you find the first churches from Paul's missionary journey. Islam is so late, so late. They got to the fight late. And we will one day see people in mass. I think there are a total of uh, I heard it in a sermon recently, I don't want to guess, but in a, I think there are 80 million people in Turkey, and I think that the, um, the, the number of Christians is somewhere around 10,000. It's, uh, or it's, 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 hor it's actually a very, very low number, maybe 100,000, but it's, it's, it's very low. But here, you see the Apostle Paul unafraid, unafraid, a olive-skinned man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. All right, olive-skinned. He did not look like me. He did not look like, well, most of you, an olive-skinned man. If you saw him on any day, you might, uh, you might mistake him for a Middle Easterner. You might have even thought that he was an Arab, perhaps. Same skin tone. And this man is, is, is ministering, and it's a second trip through Turkey. The entire first missionary journey is found earlier in the book, and it's mostly Turkey. Here, he thinks he's going to do a repeat and just go visit the churches that he ministered to and founded on his first missionary journey. And here is where the surprise occurs. In verse 6, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit suffered them not. So he thought, I'm going to turn south, and the Holy Spirit stopped him. And I'm going to turn a different direction, and the Holy Spirit stopped him. Preaching the gospel is not the wrong thing, but the location was something that God had the say in. Verse 8, and they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas. You're going to see that in just a minute in our passage for this evening. And the vision, in a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And below Macedonia is a little part of the peninsula, the Grecian peninsula, the Macedonian peninsula, depending on if you're talking to a Greek or, or an Albanian or... Uh, they'll, they'll tell you what, Mas what peninsula it is. But on the southern part of that, it used to be called Achaia. And in Achaia, or Achaia, is a little place known as Corinth. We come across it in chapter 18, in verse number 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And that really is the first time he comes into contact with Corinth. He sees people saved in Corinth. The reason there are books, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, is because of Acts 18. And the reason he is in Europe now is because he was kept, listen now, he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to stay in the Middle East. The reason you and I, white folks, those of you who fit that bill, if you don't fit that bill, it's pretty, pretty obvious, okay? But those of you who look a little like me, the reason we're saved is because Acts 16. Paul goes into Europe because the Holy Spirit said so. He saw a vision in the night, a man from Macedonia, and Paul crosses into Europe. And in chapter 18, he comes as far down as Corinth. So, then he visits again on his third missionary journey. But let's go to 2 Corinthians tonight. 2 Corinthians. There is a reason why I'm not preaching out of Matthew. It's because this is my last sermon to you as one of your pastors. The good Lord willing, I'll be back in, uh, what, 32 days to preach again on a Sunday night. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I won't be a pastor here anymore, so I have to really pray about what to preach 
Uh, what to speak to you about. What I mean, uh, let's be fair. Uh, it's going to be really obvious to me once I'm a visiting pastor that there's very little I can tell you that you haven't heard. Um, especially if you're more than one of those at once every three Sunday morning Christians. Okay. But here we are in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse number 12. Furthermore, here we are. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel... And a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Now he's describing what happened to him in Acts 16. Who described it in Acts 16? Luke. Luke did. Yep, that's right. Luke is the author of Acts 16. Here's Paul's recollection. When I was in Troas, I came to Troas, that's in, in Turkey on the coast, to preach Christ's gospel. A door was opened unto me of the Lord, or just off the coast. I had no rest in my spirit. Luke describes it as the Holy Spirit forbidding him. 2 Corinthians 2.13, Paul describes it as, I had no rest. You might notice, if you compare Scripture with Scripture, what we mean when we say, allow the peace of God to guide you. 2 Corinthians, I see some inquisitive looks over there, so I'm thinking maybe I wasn't clear. It's 2 Corinthians 2.12, 2.13 is now where we're at. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. Now, that's another surprise. Titus is nowhere to be found in the book of Acts, and so we're given more information about Acts from Paul's own epistles, and you're going to find that this happens often in Paul's letters, the epistle. That's what a letter, it's, it's, it's a letter. It's not an apostle's wife. An epistle is a letter, okay? All right, some folks are like, I don't know what that means. But those are usually the dear folks that are a little newer to church and they think Christ is Jesus' last name, all right? So, all right, so he says, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. All right, so here's Paul saying, I left a dear friend back in Turkey and I was so disturbed over it, but I had an open door to go to another place to preach the gospel. And Paul would have said, if it were up to me, I would have never left. But I felt like I had to go through this door. He says, now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. We preach Christ's gospel, verse 12. In every place, verse 14. And that is how we wage whether or not Christ is causing us to triumph. We don't think Christ is causing us to triumph because we get a raise. Or because everyone is in perfect health. Or because the car starts every time you turn the key. That is not fruit that Christ is causing us to triumph. The fruit that Christ is causing us to triumph is that he opens doors for us to preach somewhere else. And he says that it is a savor of his knowledge. People are smelling Christ when we preach. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. That's a reminder to every preacher of the gospel that there really only is an audience of one. For everyone who is called to this great work of making gospel plain to normal, simple, sinful people, like, like, like they themselves are, It's worship to them. And it could be that the strangest, froggiest, weirdest interruptions take place. And yet, what they are doing is a savor. It is, it is a sweet thing, if you can imagine God having nostrils. It's a sweet thing to God when he hears about Christ. Let me read that again. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Context, 
When are we a sweet savor of Christ to God? When we preach his gospel, verse 12. When do we know we are triumphing? When we go through open doors and preach Christ's gospel. Now, if you're not clear on what the gospel is, we are told in 1 Corinthians 15 that it is the death of Christ for our sin and his resurrection. It's very clear. It hasn't changed. It won't change for you. It won't change for me. It is going to be that forever. In fact, if you look at Revelation 14, there's an angel flying through the air preaching the everlasting gospel. I love it. I've heard people say, well, the Lord used me. I'm so thankful he used me. Uh, he could have used anyone. He could have used angels. Yes, in fact, he could have to the point where he will. And we are thankful. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. But look at the end of this verse. To, uh, this is really a little kind of shocking. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved. And in the original, it has, it's, a passive, it's a passive participle. It has, it, has, it has the idea of we are a savor of Christ to God. Now think about this in two ways. In them that are being rescued and in them that are having their life removed, perished. They're passive verbs or participials, however you English folks like that. The, the idea is that Paul says, whenever I preach, there are two ways that God is pleased. One is in those who give a savor of life to him and to others a savor of death. God, apparently from this passage, is just as glorified when people seal their fate of being unbelievers. And both are accomplished by the same preaching. The same sun that melts the snow hardens the clay. So he says it again, in case we missed it the first time, verse 16. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. While we are preaching, Paul would say, by extension, when you are sharing the gospel with your loved ones, the gospel that will not change, will not change, when you are sharing the gospel with your children and grandchildren who you question their salvation, you need to know that your audience of one in heaven likes the way the whole thing smells. It is a beautiful, beautiful scent. And to some degree, it speaks not just of Paul's preaching, but of Paul's dying while he preaches. How many of you know that a savor is typically Old Testament language for a sacrifice? and the frankincense or whatever that is sprinkled on the sacrifice that comes up before God and he is pleased. It's incense. This is sacrificial talk. Paul is incredibly skilled, but not nearly skilled enough to do this on his own. The Holy Spirit is writing through Paul, and Paul is saying that his preaching, which brings some life to those who will be saved and some death to those who will perish, brings nothing but death to him, but a different kind of death, a very physical death. A death that, by the way, if you look at chapter 4, Paul winds up the chapter saying something in verse number 16. For which cause we will not lose heart, we do not faint. But though our outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul says, for this ministry of getting the gospel to you, Corinthians, at the cost of leaving a dear friend behind in Turkey, who I, my heart quaked for, I need you to know that when I left him, are you listening? <laughs> when I left him, a part of me died. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, charity never fails. That means that you will have a part of the Sturm's heart forever. And a part of us dies when we leave you. But somehow, in this great cause of the gospel, the inward man is renewed. Somehow, the kingdom is going to be made, well, it's hard to make something perfect better 
the kingdom will come into its fullness a little bit more. And you and I, what that means, what that means, since the kingdom is made up of individuals, that means that you and I will become a little bit more alive through what is happening. It feels like death. It feels in some cases like death. Verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more and exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Now, that seems fair enough. And it's almost like he was looking at a Kincaid portrait when he wrote it. But it's not flowery. No, no, look at verse 7. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And again, why? So that his life could be manifest in our body. I want to once again encourage you, parents, to, to, to make sure that our children know that they're not looking for a way to spend their life. They're looking for a way to die. It's incredibly un, unpopular. It's incredibly unpopular. And, and the only reason that I'm saying this is because the church that I'm going to is in the middle of Wednesday night activity and they're not watching. But I am fully aware that I could totally fail there if I lean on my own understanding. Now, they don't want to hear that, do they? Promises of success, multiple services. <laughs> and the truth is, that is why Paul says in chapter 2 what he says next. Look back at chapter 2. He says, to the one, in verse 16, to the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Somehow, like I said, I'm going to say it again, somehow those who are going to go to hell, their rejection of Christ is a, is a, a, a stamp of approval of God's righteousness and an exaltation of his grace. Because I want to remind you, if God does not interfere with our little cute free will, we would all choose hellfire. Cute free will. Yeah. He interferes. I'm glad the Lord interferes. The marvel is not that he doesn't save everybody. The marvel is that he doesn't allow everyone to have what they want. And so, after Paul says all of that, he says at the end of verse 16, and who is sufficient for this? Or, as many of you have in your laps, who is adequate for all this? Paul says, if while I'm preaching the gospel, and you should be thinking along with Paul, if in my workplace I'm preaching the gospel and right there in front of me some are dying on their way to hell and others are finding life and those are the ones, both are a savor to God, one of his righteousness, one of his grace, both are a wonderful savor in the nostrils of God. I cannot believe that words that I'm speaking, faithful to God they are, God's words they are, I have first been the receptor or the receiver of those words, so I know what transforming grace feels like. But when I realize that while I'm sharing the gospel, eyes are being unscaled, hearts are being unchained, volition is being captured by the Lord, he says at the end of this verse, who, who is good enough for this task? And then he compares himself with those who are obviously not sufficient. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, or some of you have peddled the word of God, or some of you have market the word of God, if you have a home, and I think. So the idea there is, you're, we're not like some who are just out to make a good living off of preaching. We're talking about, we're talking about sincerity, sincerity. 
as of sincerity, the end of verse 17, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And so he gets on to it, and then I'm going to lay on the plane, all right? So here we go, verse 1, chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? So now Paul is taking the very, very sober reality of everything that was done to get them saved. Think about the effort. Now, this is just laughable that I'm even using these words. Think about the effort that the Holy Spirit goes through to get Corinthians saved. He interrupts a man in the night. He sends someone in a dream. He yanks a man away from his traveling partners. He sends him into strange lands where they don't know Christ. And then he allows some of them to see the Holy Spirit does. He actually opens their eyes and quickens them. Chapter 4, verse 6 says that they actually see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Yeah, wow, that's super. I love 2 Corinthians. So, so then Paul turns it around and says, so how do I prove myself to this group? Now, you got to hear me because I'm about to give you some history here. There's this group of people in the Corinthian church that were just false preachers. They, they would sometimes preach the truth, but their motive was just wrong. He mentions them in verse 17 of chapter 2. And so Paul says, do I really need to give you my credential? Do I need to? Do I need again to commend ourselves? Or do I need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Or epistles or letters of commendation from you? Do I really need to show up next Lord's Day when I come visit you with a letter from headquarters saying, Paul's really a decent guy. He says in verse 2, you, you are the epistles you are our epistles. You are the proof that the gospel that we preach works. You are the proof. You are the proof that the gospel works. That gospel, chapter 2, verse 12, that I left people I loved and came and preached to you. You are proof that it works. You are the letter. You are my letter. You're like, you are like when people see you, they see a letter from Paul. You see my preaching when, when you see him, when you see her, when you see the way that the gospel has surrounded the way that they drive, the way that they spend their money, the way that they talk to their spouse, and the way when they apologize when they don't do any of those right. All of those splendid revelations of grace. Paul says, when I see the way you do the will of God and the way that you repent after you don't do the will of God, you are doing nothing but saying, I'm one of Paul's converts. I am a letter of Paul's. And so he says in verse three, oh, by the way, in verse two, you're known and read of all men. People are reading you like a book, literally. Yes. You are telling everyone what the pastors of Berean preach. Not because you squawk like we squawk, talk like we talk, no, because you walk like we talk. People read you like a book. And so verse 3, 4, as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Where? Where, Paul? If the spirit of the living God is doing the writing on us, the parchment, where is the etching being made? not on tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Yes. When people look at you, they see someone that looks an awful lot like the gospel they heard Paul preach, just walking and talking. Uh, we used to sing a song. I wish I knew where it came from. Um, I mean, I know, I wish then, I, I wish now that I knew then where it came from. But as a kid, I might have enjoyed it a little bit uh, more. I actually got the words wrong a hundred times probably, but... Do you know, oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Anyone hear that? You have to be an old hatter, man. You gotta be like Sunday school, like 80s, 1980s Sunday school. <laughs> Do you know, oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Jesus calls upon you to spread the gospel news. Anyone ever sing that besides me? Was that the only one? Ever? Okay, you're from the north, I get it. Did you get this ever? Hills? No. Wisconsin? New York? Right? Were you from New York back then, Sonia? Minnesota, right? And that's where you heard it, right? Okay. So, yeah, we heard other strange songs like, um, um, you know, well, a lot of them in the hymn book that when you open them here, they're like, what is that, right? Um, 
So here in verse 4, here's what Paul says. In such trust we have through Christ to God. Not as, look here, verse 5. Not as we are adequate. Now look, you're going to see this repeating word. I'm about to land it here, but I need you to see this repeating word. At the end of verse 16 of chapter 2, he says, Who is adequate or sufficient for these things? Now he's going to answer the question. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are adequate or sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now, here's what Paul is saying. I preached to you. I'm not adequate to preach to you. You are good sermons on my behalf, but it's not because I was an adequate preacher. I already told you, chapter 2, verse 17, I am not adequate for the task. But the reason that my ministry proved to be adequate was because of something. So let's keep reading. Our adequacy or our adequate flavor, our sufficiency at the end of verse five is of God, verse six, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament. That word able in my King James Bible is the same word as the word sufficient in the King James Bible. Maybe some of you have maybe a lower regulated translation. Here's what you should see. If you saw adequate in chapter two, verse 17, or verse 16, and you saw adequate in chapter three, verse five, you should see adequate at the beginning of verse six. Anyone like that out there? Okay, so who, who's adequate for this? Chapter two, verse 16. We're not adequate of ourselves, chapter three, verse five, but God is, end of chapter three, verse five, verse six, he made us adequate ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. And then he goes through this comparison between the Old and New Covenant, and here's what he says in verse number 11. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. And so here's Paul's summary. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now, having said everything I've said, I said all this to say this. As I pastored here, I will be challenged in several ways in which I will be challenged at Sandy Ridge Baptist Church in Hickory. Should the Lord allow, this is how, how important it is to be an able minister of the New Testament. If I were to break it down, here it is. I'm landing the plane. You can almost pick up your children. Here we go. While... I want to be accessible as a pastor. And while I have striven to be accessible as a pastor, I want my preaching to be memorable. While I may desire to be memorable as a whole preacher, pastor, my preaching is to be a major part of that memory. If you would like to be an encouragement like many of you are to the next guy who stands up here on Wednesday night, may I encourage you to talk to him about his preaching. Because if he's called to do this, he's not necessarily interested in making you laugh. He's interested in being an able or adequate minister of this very important gospel. Second, while I desire to be admirable in all things, the main focus of my all things is the preaching of the gospel and its myriad of secondary and tertiary effects in our lives, both individually as people in these pews and collectively as people that make up this church. So, while I would love to be admirable in my preaching and as a pastor, my main focus is whether I will be adequately filled with the power of Christ. There's a problem with something when we can't remember what we heard preached the night before. It could be the preacher. It could be. Number three. While I desire to be amiable... I said accessible, admirable, you know, you know. I want to end this thing with an alliterated outline. While I desire to be amiable, that means likable. I want you to like me. While I desired to do that these last seven years, my expertise is supposed to be in godliness, biblical aptitude, and theology, and how it applies to, how it applies to you in your life. So, while I desire to be administratively savvy. Do you like that, A? Eh? Many desire to be skilled. Rather, you should say, my desire is to be skilled in the word of God. 
Hebrews 4 commands me by its implications that I be skilled using that scalpel to operate on souls. I'm not supposed to be just an expert on NASCAR so that you like me. Or an, an expert on cooking, which I'm not, so that you like me. Or an expert on hunting, so that you like me. I want to make conversation with everyone in the room on different things, but that doesn't make me an able minister of the New Testament. The guy standing up behind me, you know who it is. But if it's anyone at your future church, wherever it is, the main test of whether or not that man is a good pastor, the main test, not the only test, but the main test, is not whether he's accessible and shepherds your heart or admirable and that you like the way he wears his suit or amiable. I mean, he can just talk about any sport with you and man, he can quote movies from 40 years ago. It's amazing. Or administratively savvy. You know I'm, I'm going to go to a church and I'm going to be expected to produce fun and funds. And I'm not excited about either. It just kind of happens. I'm a little spontaneous. Things, I, I don't have any funny things in my notes up here. Make sure you say something here to make them laugh. I, I want to be really accurate with how I handle this. If a doctor who is a specialist, say in oncology, goes to school and graduate school for 10 years, and all, listen to me, I'm not minimizing what doctors do, but if all they do is touch your body, then what about the man who's supposed to operate on your soul? Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Luke wrote Hebrews, I'm pretty well assured, because the word there is a medical word. It's the word for scalpel. And he says it divides even to the sunder of soul and spirit. He says we operate on souls with the word of God. How skilled do you want the man to be when he handles the word of God? Would you prefer that he's up to date on all the latest sitcoms? Or would you prefer that when he stands before you and preaches, you know that God is speaking through him? While I desire to be applicable, teaching with authority is really what I want to do. Jesus received this appraisal on the heels of his Sermon on the Mount. It says he preached with great, taught with great authority, not like the scribes. So while I want to be applicable, more what I want you to do is, is, is say, oh my goodness, I have to change something. So everything is gospel-centered, okay? So let's talk about Orlando. It's a gospel issue. And you need to use your outlets of influence to keep it around the gospel. This is not about making fun of people who blame it on the gun. You're just a good Republican if you do that. Did I make you mad? Saying it is the problem with gun control, that doesn't make you a good Christian. It makes you a good Democrat. Did I make you mad? It's my last service. So you're not, I, you, what are you going to do, fire? <laughs> No. It really, though, when Orlando, when we see that it is a gospel situation, it describes the reality that whether we're talking about sex or religion like Islam, mostly those needs are met, mostly those needs are met avoiding the God who designed us. God made those pure prototypes, monogamous marriage between a man and a woman. God made the prototype of religion when he promised the Messiah in the Garden of Eden. Usually, both the Muslim, whether he's radical, whatever that means, a radical Christian dies for his faith. Okay? A radical Christian prays for homosexuals who are, and their families who are affected. That's what radical Christians do. I don't know what radical Muslims do. I've got a pretty good idea by now. But radical Christians die for their enemies. Y'all like me still? This whole thing is exacerbated with the reality that so many, through so many methods, are expediting and purporting their own spins and agendas. This is a gospel issue. It seems it is furthermore a gospel issue when the Christ, who was void of any sin, experienced the sorrow with said sinners that their sin caused his grief and sorrow. So... I will grant you, one of the first things I thought was, well, it happened at a gay bar. Step one, don't go to a gay bar. But almost 100 people that God made in his image and that Christ died for, yes, my theology allows for that. 
I can walk up to any one of those yes. 85, 95 people's families and say, Christ died for your sin. And, and by the way, I can walk up to anyone on the street who's never been to a gay bar and say, you better get saved too or you will all likewise perish. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about the Olympics real quick and then I'm really, 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 really done. The issue of the Olympics is also a gospel issue. Consider that while the U.S. Olympic Committee has banned a championship swimmer for life from competing in the Olympics for his involvement in the rape of a, of a drunk young girl, right? Are y'all with me? Y'all listen to the news at all? Okay. The preacher must be able to recognize the gospel ramifications when the International Olympic Committee allows males to compete as females without even having sex change surgery. I'm sorry, let me church it up. Gender reassignment <laughs> surgery. There, it's a little easier now, okay? Now think about that double standard. International committee says gender is really not that important. Over here, this dude needs to be banned for life because he victimized a girl. Over here, you're minimizing gender. Over here, when it's convenient... This is a gospel issue. The gospel ramification is that the same God who provided for the reconciliation of a sinful people first made those people in his image. When that image reflected in a male-female creation of day six is distorted and gender roles are confused and responsibilities are dismissed, certain things result and usually they're tragic. The gospel ramification is that the world becomes more sinful, sinful, sinners become more desperate, and a crucified Savior becomes more sweet. And that is why we preach the gospel. We look for bridges and inroads of the gospel to new places, uncomfortable places, difficult places, places we never would go if God didn't open the door. And... Uh, and we always find the gospel ramification, whether it's a disobedient child or it is someone who passes away or it's someone who gets beat up because they're in a restaurant of ill repute on McPherson Church. You know, you say, well, they shouldn't have been there. I got it. But they need to be saved. You've been very patient. The time is up. I have much more to say. You've been very patient. So let us pray. Father, none of us are adequate for this case, for this cause. But tonight, my mind is on what we've been attempting to do with faithful Bereans for seven years. What will continue to occur here for many more years, should you tarry, should you allow. And what we hope to do in Hickory. We're not sufficient for the task, but you are. You are able, from this testimony of this scripture, if you can save a terrorist like Paul and make him an able minister, then I feel like I qualify for the same empowerment from the Holy Spirit, if you are willing. And so we look forward to future times of fellowship and reunion, and yet we know your work must be done. The great missionary who left heaven and went to an uncomfortable place and died for people that were nothing like him, that gracious God compels us to be likewise very gracious. We look forward to the final reunion where we will be together with those who have gone on before us. And all this is made possible because of the provision of your own son. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.